Well, good morning, saints. Let me try that again. Good morning, sinners. There's more sinners, and I'm in the right place. Hallelujah. This is fresh meat. Amen. I'm Mike Robertson. I'm from Visalia, California. I don't know if you know where that is. It's where the deer and the antelope play. And uh, yes, 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 yes. So, um, well, I'm going to talk to you today about the God nudge. Somebody say God nudge. I believe that God is looking for some people, some go-to people this morning that he could nudge on the shoulder and you would go and do something for him. How many want to be used to God? I think we all do. I think we all do. Now, just a little bit about me. I grew up in Littlefield, Texas, West Texas, out there where the oil is. And uh, yes, it's sort of a Mayberry kind of town, just a little bitty town. We didn't lock our doors. Uh, Back in the day, we walked to school 25 miles in the snow, you know, all those kinds of things that Daddy lied about. And uh, well, one of the things that I was taught in that Mayberry existence of town was you don't get too personal with people. You don't want to ask people too many personal questions. For example, you never ask a woman how old she is, son. Don't ever ask a woman, why not, Mama? I, I want to know their... No, son, just trust me. Don't ask a woman how old she is. And whatever you do, don't ask her how much she weighs. <laughs> no, son. That just, I mean, Mama taught me these things. And Mama taught me... You don't, you don't ask a man, is that a toupee you're wearing? Uh, you, don't, you don't ask those personal questions. You don't, you don't ask a a person, if they've had uh, reconstruction surgery on their face, hey, how's that? That looks like you had a little work done there. How's that working? Don't ask those personal questions. But I'm here today, and I'm going to cross the line, and I'm going to ask you a personal question. Every single one of you, I'm going to ask you this personal question. Right now, right now, are you Filled with the Holy Spirit. There's one hand clap over there. Uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> I got my work cut out for me today. No, honestly, honestly, not where you filled a year ago, not where you, well, I think I was, maybe I am, I'm not sure. No, 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 no. There's only one of three answers that you'll ever give to a question like that. First of all, if you're a Christian, you ought to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, that, that, that's, not, that's non-debatable. I mean, it's one thing to be the baptized in water. It's one t- thing to be baptized in the family of God. It's a whole nother level when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Can somebody say amen that's been filled with the Spirit? And so, number one, if you're a Christian, you ought to go for that second, second level where there is power New Testament, resurrection power. Jesus said that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, dwells in me. That's the kind of power I'm talking about. Or secondly, you ought to know if you're filled. You ought to know if you're filled. And I can tell you, if you're filled, you sort of wake up funny. You start thinking about God really quick. Uh, you start just thinking about it. You just love him. I love these songs that Brendan led us in this morning. We just, I mean, and, and yesterday's oil is not good enough. I want something fresh. I want something new today. I want the power of God to operate in my life today. And it's, that's, that's a person who's filled with the Spirit. I can't get enough. I can't get enough. And I want more of his love. Another thing is I think that a lot of Christians just don't understand what it is to be Spirit-filled. But I want to talk to you about that today. And if you have a Bible, I want you to go over to 1 Kings chapter number 22. 1 Kings chapter number 22. I'm going to read a long passage of Scripture, but I think that's okay in this Baptist church, isn't it? <clears throat> yes, I appreciate that. Uh, um, I pray at the end some good things will happen to all of us in this room because I want to really, I really want to help you in some areas of being filled with the Holy Spirit and... Um, uh, but I got a question for you. Now, I'm going to do something today that's a little unusual. Because I'm going to go back to the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, the hand of the Lord came upon people. 
and he filled people for a moment for a mission that he had for them to do. The hand of the Lord came upon Jeremiah. The hand of the Lord came upon Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord came upon this prophet. The hand of the Lord came upon that judge. And you see it all throughout the Old Testament, the hand of the Lord coming upon people. But when Jesus came to the earth, it changed the game completely. When Jesus came to the earth and he died for all, once and for all, for all of your sins, the game totally changed. The resurrection changed everything. And Jesus kept telling his boys, boys, I got to get out of here. Because if I go not away, the Holy Spirit cannot come. As long as I'm on the earth, I'm preventing him from coming to the earth. And once he comes to the earth, buddy, every one of you need to head out there and get filled with Holy Spirit. I know all y'all believe, but you need this second work. You need the Holy Spirit empowerment. The best thing Jesus ever did for the church was get off the earth. <laughs> The best thing he ever did was come to the earth to die for our sin. But another best thing he ever did was leave. And when he left, 50 days later, the day of Pentecost came, and everybody, every single one, it's no longer the hand of the Lord came upon him, hand of the Lord came upon her. Over here, we saw it, we heard about it, something happened in L.A. No, 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 no. The Holy Spirit comes upon every single individual. That is good news for everybody in this house. God is willing to come upon you like he came upon those prophets in the Old Testament. Somebody say amen. So I'm going to ask you a question. What's going on in heaven right now? I want you to answer me. What do you think is going on in heaven right now? Somebody give me an answer. Praise and worship. Somebody else. What's that? Did he say sinning? There's no sinning, brother. Now, you have to understand, ever since I turned 42, I get hard of hearing, so speak up real loud. What did you say? Watching and waiting. Now, I like that. I like that. Yeah. Okay. Enough from the liberals. Let's go to the conservatives. Do we have anything on my, in my right wingers? Do we have anything over here? Celebration. Celebration. These are all happening. Reunions, loved ones, no more crying. Hallelujah. But nobody said what I'm about to show you in this passage of Scripture right here. In 1 Kings chapter number 22, this is a lengthy passage of Scripture, but I want you to stay with me because I'm going to show you something very, very important here, how God wants to use every single one of us. Now, it's going to come up on your screens, but it's in the New International Version of the Bible. For three years, there was no war between Aram and Israel. But in the third year, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went down to see the king of Israel. The king of Israel had said to his officials, Don't you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us, and yet we're doing nothing to retake it back from the king of Aram? So Jehoshaphat, they asked Jehoshaphat, Will you go down there and fight with us? Jehoshaphat replied to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, and my horses as your people. But Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, First, let's check counsel from the Lord. How many know it's good to pray about everything? We better pray about this, Jehoshaphat said. So verse 6, so the king of Israel brought together all these prophets. He had about 400 of them out there. and He said, shall we go to war with Ramah and Gilead or shall we not? Go, oh, answered all the prophets, the Lord will give it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat, watch this, Jehoshaphat loves God with all of his heart. This old other guy doesn't, but Jehoshaphat said, Is there no longer a prophet of Yahweh? Is there no real prophet? I'm, I hear all your Baal prophets, your Asherah prophets, but where's the man of God that represents Yahweh, the God of Moses? And the king said in verse 8, answered, said, Well, there's one left. I don't like him very much. He can inquire of the Lord from us, but I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me. He's always bad. It's Micaiah, the son of Imla. The king said, don't say such things like that about a prophet of Yahweh. The king said, called one of his officials, said, bring Micaiah, the son of Imla, up here once. Dressed in their royal robes, the kings of Israel were, and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, were sitting on the thrones of the threshing floor of the entrance of the gate of Samaria. With all the prophets prophesying, now Zedekiah, son of Canaan, he had made iron horns and declared, this is what the Lord says. 
With these we will discord these Armenians until they are destroyed. All the other prophets were prophesying the exact same thing. Attack Ramoth Gilead and be victorious. They said, for the Lord has given it into the king's hand. Verse 13, the messenger went down there and he summons Micaiah, the son, uh, said to him, look, the other prophets without exceptions are predicting success for the king. Let your words agree with theirs. Speak favorably. Micaiah said this, as surely as the Lord lives, I can only tell him what the Lord tells me. When he arrived, the king asked him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or not? He said, attack and be victorious, he answered. For the Lord's going to give it into the king's hands. Then the king said to him, how many times must I swear? Must you tell me that nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Micaiah said, okay, you want the truth, big boy? Here's the truth. This is what I saw. I saw all Israel scattered on the hills like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, these people have no master. Let every one of them just go home and there will be peace. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I tell you he never prophesies anything good about me, only the bad? Micaiah continued, therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne with all his multitudes. Now here's where I wanted to get you, right here. This is what's happening in heaven. It's not a worship service. It's not meeting loved ones. It's not celebration. There's a staff meeting going on right here in heaven. Micaiah said, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the multitudes of heaven standing around him on the, and on his right and on his left. And the Lord was talking. Who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death there? One suggested this, another that. Finally, a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I'll entice him. By what means, the Lord said, I will go out there and be a lying spirit, a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets, he said. The Lord said, you will succeed in enticing him. Go for it. Now, the Lord has put the deceiving spirit in the mouth of all your prophets, king. The Lord has decreed disaster on you. Then Zedekiah, the son of Canuth, went up and slapped Micaiah in the face. Which way did the spirit from the Lord go when he went from me to speak to you, he asked. Micaiah replied, you'll find out on the day that you go hide yourself in a prayer room. Then the king of Israel then ordered, take Micaiah, send him back to the Amnon, the ruler of the city, and Joash, the king's son, and say to him, this is what the king says, put this fellow in prison. And give him nothing but bread and water till I return safely. Micaiah declared, declared, if you ever return safely, the Lord has not spoken through me. Then he added, mark my words, all you people. Somebody say thank God for his word. Now what has happened here is the king of Israel has gone to the king of Judah and said, I'm going to go pick a fight with this country and get some of our land back. And Ahab was a worthless king. He's probably the most wicked king ever lived. His wife was sorry as a sack of potatoes. I mean, Jezebel. I mean, she's a wicked, nasty old woman. I mean, I can't even start talking about Jezebel. But he tried to get the godly man. Hey, if I get the godly king to go with me, maybe the Lord will help me out because I haven't heard from the Lord in a long time. And the Lord was fed up with old Ahab. And all of a sudden, these 400 prophets were lying But about a half a dozen times throughout the Bible, God will unzip the veil between now and eternity. You'll see throughout the Bible, every now and then, God will let us glimpse over into the other side and see what's going on. And this is what he does in this case right here. And they they have a strategy session going on. And the Lord's saying, I'm ready to get rid of Ahab. How are we going to do it? And the staff... People are saying, do this, do that, do this. And one of them comes up and says, let's put a lying spirit on all those prophets of Baal that he's got. And the Lord said, I like that. How many of you know that God can use evil just like he can use good? God can do whatever he wants to. He's God. Somebody say he's God. Well, then this prophet comes along and he says, you know, uh, King, this, I was praying and the Lord showed me. You're headed to die, boy. And you, this is your last day. And you... I mean, you, you've outrun your course. You've outrun your day of grace. I mean, you've sinned enough. The Lord said it's enough. You're gone, big boy. And nobody wanted to hear that bad news. And they put him back in prison and said, well, uh, 
if I didn't tell the truth, may I stay in prison? But sure enough, he was telling the truth. The next day, oh, Ahab went into battle, and he died. And it was all true what this 100 prophet said. Here's what I want you to think for a second. I don't have much time, but let me unpack it like this. There are literally thousands upon thousands of prayers going up right now in the Bakersfield area to the Lord. Thousands and thousands and thousands of prayers coming off the earth. You put all the prayers coming off the earth, it's got to be billions of prayers every single day coming off the earth. Now, how in the world is God going to answer all of those prayers? Well, let's go down the list. Well, can God come down here and answer those prayers? No. No. God's only showed up a couple times, and it freaked Elijah out, and it freaked Moses out as well. No, God's not showing up. Can Jesus come down here and start answering all your prayers? Jesus is not coming back, baby, until the second return of the Lord. That's when he touches his foot down on Mount Olives. It is not going to happen until we all go home. I mean, agree with that. Say amen. And what was the first thing that angels always said to people when they showed up? Don't be afraid. No, no, I don't, don't be freaking out now. I'm just an angel. Fear not. Every time an angel showed up, it freaked people out. They're probably 9, 12 foot tall and, I mean, looked like Shaquille O'Neal three times over or something. I don't know. Freaks people out, scares people. So all God's got left is us. So I want you to picture it like this. There, there's, there, it's like Bruce Wilkerson. I, I like what he said. It's like there must be a mission central in heaven, prayer mission central, where all these prayers are going up into this, into this prayer central, and all of these angels are trying to decide, how are we going to answer these prayers? I mean, somebody on your street prayed this morning, Lord, I need some money. I don't have any groceries. Somebody at your work prayed today and said, Lord, I need to hear from you. Somebody prayed this, someone prayed that, but this is what heaven, this is, what heaven is doing. The Bible says in, in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, that the eyes of the Lord go to and fro about the earth, seeking someone he may show himself strong to. The eyes of the Lord are going across this service right now. The Spirit of the Lord is moving in here, and he's saying, who can I go and, and, and who can I use to go answer this lady's prayer this afternoon? Who can I use to go tell this man at work that's been praying about his child? Who, who, can I, who can I flow through? Who can I use? I want to fill out a couple things on your note because I'm getting ahead of myself. But the thing is, God did not place us on the earth to witness a miracle just once or twice in our lifetime. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, and your pastors, both of them, they believe that God wants to use us supernaturally every single day of our lives. And, you, you, you know, you ought to just wake up and say every day, Lord, I'm available. I'm available. If you need me to be used of you today, I am available. Here's three ways, real quick, how to be used of God, and this is it. Number one, sign up. Somebody say sign up. Turn in your job application. Honestly, this seems real simple, but I'm telling you the truth. I do it every day. I said, Lord, I'm available today. I know somebody's praying that needs a miracle. I want to be that miracle agent. Use me, Lord. You know I'm free, I'm free with my money. You can use my money. You can use me. I'll even give you my wife. That one didn't come out right, did it? Asking God, write this one down, asking God to be sent to do God's work is the number one key in the God nuts. God, would you use me? Oh, heaven central is saying, man, I was hoping you would add. We need about a thousand of you right there in Bakersfield. Number two, pray up. Pray up. Somebody say sign up. Somebody say pray up. And you've got to get into effective kind of praying. There's two types of praying. There's effective and ineffective praying. And the most effective praying on the earth is this. Write it down. Effective praying is discerning what God wants and not what we want. 
ineffective praying is trying to persuade God what he needs to do on the earth. I know I mixed those up, but you're a very highly educated bunch. That's what your pastor told me. I was praying one day for my wife. Your back went out. I am married, happily married, my beautiful wife, Karen. And uh, she's from Arkansas. I'm from Texas. She married me to get her citizenship. Uh, we were pastoring down here in Oceanside where we met uh, Pastor Veronica and Pastor Jason, we met these guys when they were in the military in Oceanside. They went to our church in Oceanside, a church plant down there. And one day her back went out horribly, and, and there was a guy in the church that was a colonel. He's a retired old colonel, but he was an on-fire Christian guy and knew how to pray. And he came in the office one day, and I said, Colonel, I'm so glad you're here. My wife's back went out. Would you come over here and help me pray? He said, yes, sir, I love praying. The old colonel came back to my office. Karen was sitting down on a chair, and I got over here, and I just started doing what I do. Lord Jesus, you got to touch my wife. Lord Jesus, if you don't touch my wife, I don't know. we got ministry to do, Lord. And we, Lord Jesus, I beg you. About that time, he's a big old colonel. He reached over there and slapped, bang, stop it. And he got mad at me, Pastor Jason. He said, that's foolish. Don't pray that away. Now, I'm the pastor of the church. <laughs> Who are you talking to? Well, he's a colonel. <laughs> he said, watch this. He was like mad at me for not knowing how to pray better. And he said, watch this. In Jesus' name. Stand up, young lady. Completely healed of her entire back problems over... This old fella just speaking in faith a half a dozen words. I learned that day there is effective praying. And then there's this nonsense praying that Jesus said, don't pray those babbly prayers. And I used to have a guy in our church that he loved to pray, but man, he wore me out with his praying because he got caught up on these phrases. He always, he said, dear God, my father. And, and I'd ask him to pray for people sometime and he'd come over and He'd say, dear God, my father, and touch it, dear God, my father, touch it, and dear God, my father, dear God, my father, dear God. And I looked at him, I said, what are you doing? He said, that's why I pray. I said, that's foolish. Dear God, my father, he, are, he knows where, he knows, he, what? just pray in faith, believing. I mean, sometimes, I mean, come on, somebody. We've all prayed some stupid prayers. Lord, I don't know if you know this, Lord, <laughs> but I got a problem. Hey, by the way, I'm down here in Bakersfield, you know, my address, you know, and then, Lord, you know, my child I got, I don't know if you know how bad she's being right now, and, and come on, Jethro, you're trying to tell something, to, you're trying to tell the creator the ends of the universe, the all-knowing, all-omnipotent, all my present God. You're trying to tell him something. You need a check up from the neck up. <laughs> no. This is how we should pray. Lord, I'm available. What can I do for you today? I just want to tell you I love you. I thank you for letting me into the kingdom. I'm entering your gates with thanksgiving, your porch with praise. Let's go kick some devil booty. I don't know if you say booty, but I do. <laughs> Somebody say sign up. Somebody say pray up. And here's another one. I missed one. What is my next one? Oh, tell guilt to shut up. Woo, this is my favorite one. Because the devil used guilt on me for years to sideline me and put me on the road and made me ineffective. Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, probably the most quoted chapter of the book of Isaiah, great book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6, do you have that on the screens, guys? I want to read that. Isaiah chapter 6, it was, now what you got to understand here, Isaiah is a cousin to King Uzziah. King Uzziah was a godly man. He was he had ruled for like 50-something years, and he really loved the Lord, and everything was cool 
as long as King Uzziah was in charge, but he died. And his cousin, Isaiah, goes to the church and with his brothers and sisters, and they're just crying out to the Lord, what are we going to do? The man of God is dead. So it was in the year the King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Uh-oh. He went to church, and he saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Watch it. Here we go. Here's a second time. God is unzipping the veil and letting us peek into what's going on in heaven. Look at this. He said, above it, I saw seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain, he covered his face. And twain, he covered his feet. And with twain, he did fly. And one cried out to the other. These are angels talking to him. Holy, holy. Can you read that part with me? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Man. And when the posts of the doors moved at that voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke, Isaiah just went to church, and this thing has happened. Then he said, whoa, 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 I'm a goner. I'm undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. I mean, God shows up, and one of the most godly men of all time is saying, I'm dirty. I dwell, and I, I can't be here. It's the presence of God. And I dwell amongst the, amongst the people with unclean lips. Me and, my bro, me and my boys have been talking some smack. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And one of the seraphims flew unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the thongs on the altar and off the altar and he laid it upon my mouth and said lo this has touched your lips thine iniquity is taken away and thy sin has been purged and I heard the voice of the Lord saying whom shall I send then whom shall I go and I said I cannot tell you how the Hebrew puts this it's in such a command mode Isaiah is yelling here am I please use me and then God said okay you're it buddy you're it you get what happened here. God's looking for somebody to take the place of old King Uzziah's godliness. And now he's moving it over to a prophet by the name of Isaiah. But Isaiah says, I went into the presence of God, man. And I just remembered all my past and all my trash talking and all the stupid things. I'll tell you exactly what happened to Isaiah. The devil showed up. About the time God is going to use you your greatest, the devil's going to start showing up and starts whispering his stupid thing. How about that sin you committed in 1987? Ah, oh, yeah, what, remember what you were thinking last week about that fella? Uh-huh. I mean, the devil is not going to stop, y'all. Until you die, he's going to be on your shoulder telling you how worthless you are, accusing you of your fleshly sins or whatever. But I'm saying it's time for you and I to tell guilt to shut up. I am a child of the living God. His blood is flowing through my veins. I fight that battle. Pastors fight that battle. We fight that battle every day. The enemy wants to tell us we cannot be used to God, but we got some real quick ways of dealing with that. The blood of Jesus is on this doorpost of this life right here. This is not a playground for evil to traffic in. No, 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 no. You tell guilt to shut up. Well, the angel took a coal off the altar and touched this guy's lips and, and boom, what was happening? God needed someone that he could use, but this someone is about to do what literally millions of other people have done they get put on the sideline because they don't think that they're worthy to be filled with the Spirit. They don't think that they're holy enough to be filled with the Spirit. I was smoking a joint one day. Not recently. <laughs> Pastor worries about me sometimes. <laughs> I was 19 years of age, 
I was 19 years of age, and beer drinking, dope smoking, knucklehead. I just smoked a joint, and I went to the grocery store, and I was stocking groceries. I was a stock boy. The lady came down the canned good aisle. She said, you ought to go to church. I said, why? Got any honeys over at that church? I'm 19. What does a 19-year-old think about? She said, oh, we got a lot of honeys. Are you serious? You for real? Yeah. What time it start? I showed up at that church that night, opened the door, and she lied. When they hunted in that house, they were in a prayer meeting. So I said, I'll go on in. Came in, I sat in the middle. There wasn't very many people there. A skinny old preacher in the front looked at me and said, You look like you could use some prayer. I said, Buddy, <laughs> if you knew where I've been, you. I said, Yeah. He said, You mind coming down here and let us pray for you? I said, Okay. I've never been in a church like Discovery. I've never been in this crazy worship kind of place, people. I didn't know what I was doing, but he said, come down there. So I came down to the front. He said, you sure it's okay? And I did not know what it meant. But I said, I think it's okay. And I got down on my knees, and I knelt down on one knee, and I saw someone on TV do this before, and so that's what I did. <laughs> I'm ready. He said, let's pray for him. About 20 people, prayer warriors came over, and, they, and I'm, I'm like, it's like sick him. I'm in the middle of this. I mean, these folk going crazy. They crazy. I mean, this old boy behind me was hollering. This old boy over here was hollering. And this girl right in front of me, she had a little split between her teeth, and every time she hit a T, she would spit on me. <laughs> Now, these people were aggressive in their praying. They weren't Mickey Mouse around. I mean, they were, they were, it's like they were wolves and I was fresh meat. I said, maybe this is the baptism, the sprinkly, sprinkly, because I'm getting my face wet. They went on for 15, 20 minutes, Pastor. And finally, the old preacher said, that's enough. Got up. Something's different. There's some power on me right now. I have been high on a lot of stuff. Been drunk many times. Been in jail a lot. But man, I never felt this before. I walk out on the porch of that that night and I stared up and I said, my goodness, how bright the stars are. I've dropped four major habits in that one prayer. I dropped four major habits in one prayer. And I went back in. I said, what in the world? He said, son, I believe the Holy Spirit just filled, filled your life. I said, I don't know what it was, but I want more of that. That was 40 years ago, and I haven't gone back. It worked. It worked. So where are you? Where are you? Where are you? The Holy Spirit wants to fill every single one of us in this church. And hopefully by Pentecost Sunday, which is in a couple weeks, every one of you will reach your hands to the heavens and say, I'm a candidate, Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, I want to give you an assignment. Between now, that's two, two weeks, Pastor. Between now and two, two weeks from today, I want you to go home every day, find you a, play, a quiet place. Maybe it's in your car where nobody else is around. And you pray this simple prayer. Lord, 
Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I've seen more people get filled with the Holy Spirit by themselves, I think, than I have in church. Because when you're by yourself, all the pressure's off. You're not being spit on by a split tooth. But this is the, this is the battle you've got to fight. You've got to deal. You've got to deal. You've got to deal with if you're a prodigal and you're in your service right now and you're a prodigal. The prodigal is sitting in the pig pen in Luke 15. The Bible says he came to himself. He said, I'm better off over there at my daddy's house being a servant than I am over here hanging out with these hogs. You know, the devil's desire, if you're in the sin right now, the devil's desire is to put you deeper and deeper and so deep into sin that you don't look anything like a Christian. But I'm here to tell you that does not have to be. And I want to tell you, I got a word for somebody this morning. You've been feeling like you didn't know if you're really even saved because the devil's been beating your lights out. I'm going to tell you something. If the devil's really beating you up, it's because God's about to fill you up. God's about to use you in an unusual way. And this is the last thing. This is why I know you're going to be okay because if you've ever been around sheep, they walk over to a mud puddle, and that sheep will go around that mud puddle. If that sheep ever falls in that mud puddle, that sheep will jump out of that mud puddle. Sheep do not like mud puddles. But you have an old pig or a hog come by, They'll jump in that mud puddle. They'll lay down in that mud puddle. They'll roll over and over and over in that mud puddle. Ladies and gentlemen, you are not a pig. <laughs> you are a sheep. You're a child of the living God. He is your shepherd. And you need to tell the devil next time he pulls that guilt on you, I am a child of God. I am not putting up with you, devil. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.